hi, my name is Mary Robinson, and I'm here with grief and trauma specialist, Joe McMahon. She specializes in loss due to suicide. I work as a psychotherapist with a focus on grief, trauma, and bereavement. We are here to talk about the possibility of hope, healing, and even transformation after suffering a traumatic loss. So, hi, Jill. Hi, Mary. How are you? How fun that they chose you and I to kind of swoop into the middle of their big day and, and have this important conversation. I'm yeah. glad to get to do that with you. I'm I'm very happy to do it with you and, and to be here supporting Eric's house. Um, so I thought it might be a good idea since we're going to be talking about coping with traumatic loss and trauma. If we start off by just defining what we mean by trauma in our talk today, because the word is used a lot, um, but we're going to be using the word very intentionally. So I thought it would be good if you could start with a definition. I actually love that you asked that and you bring up a really good point, especially now in 2024, trauma is a bit of a catchy phrase currently, right? And Eric's house is very... Um, centralized and passionate around their definition of trauma and what their work really does to serve trauma. So I found what I feel is a definition that um, resonates the best with me in trauma work that I've done for over 25 years. And it's, it's a person's experience of emotional distress resulting from an event that overwhelms the capacity to emotional emotionally digest it. So I'm going to say that one more time because I think it's it's a lot of words but it actually makes a lot of sense. A person's experience of emotional distress resulting from an event that overwhelms the capacity to emotionally digest it. So in other words, in short and layman's term, it's when an event is just too much for the brain to digest. Right. Yeah. And that could be anything depending on the person. So I love that you wanted to bring up what is trauma, especially with our audience today, because what is traumatic for one person isn't necessarily traumatic for the other person. Right. So yeah. that's why I think that definition really suits. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I, I also think that, um, you know, people, even they use the word trauma, just assume that, you know, people are traumatized, but exactly what you said, two people can experience the exact same thing mm -hmm. and one could experience, be traumatized and someone else not. Exactly. And I think that one of the things that Eric's house does so brilliantly is to provide the kind of support that people need after what you might say is a traumatic loss in Eric's house specifically suicide and loss due to substances. Right. So um, I love to tell people you can experience trauma, but a trauma doesn't have to leave you traumatized if there you, get, you go. get support. Right. right. Um, yeah, so I think you and I could even dive deeper into that and we won't today, but you know, a, a topic for maybe next time for anybody who's yes. watching, you yes. know, people hear the term trauma and then they go instantly to PTSD. Yes. And I have, I have the same opinion about PTSD as you just had about trauma. You know, not everybody that's been traumatized is going to experience PTSD. Actually it's, it's less than 20%, but again, that is a very, um, popular phrase right now. Yeah. So we just, we yeah. just opened up with what is trauma and it's, it's a little bit different for everyone, but at the end of the day, it's any event that just feels like more than the brain can handle. Right. Got it. So can you talk about what it's like for people to experience trauma physically and emotionally? Ooh, um, yeah, because I, I think that it's typecast, right? So Eric's house specifically, and I know that all of our viewers now hopefully have a greater understanding of Eric's house mission and the population that we serve, but Eric's house really takes a stand for those that have experienced sudden loss, mm -hmm. particularly suicide um, or drug, drug overdose, loss due to drug use. Oftentimes those are sudden and scary, even if there has been a struggle before, right? And so that type of unexpected loss, even if there were 10 suicide notes written before, 
For some reason that day, that time, that month, we're shocked and we never really believed that our person was going to do it or we thought they were getting better or we thought that they were using less or we thought that they had gotten help right so it's a shock to our system so the mm-hmm. trauma that the brain experiences when um it has been faced with a sudden loss is brain fog um i call it swiss cheese brain just because i think that that's a great visual it's the inability to track, to keep time, to know what day of the week it is, um, to honestly forget to eat, to I've forgotten my aunt's name. I don't even know how to get to the grocery store. Um, I have an amazing client that actually works for the local hospice organization here. And she is a grief specialist and has been for 30 years. And after her husband died, she would call me and go, Jill, it's 530 in the afternoon. I've just walked out to my car and I realized that once again, I left my driver's side door open for the last eight hours. Mm -hmm. That's what I call Swiss cheese brain, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of that fog. It's feeling overwhelmed. It's shock and denial that often comes after a sudden loss. Um, it doesn't last forever. And I always say that shock and denial protects us. Yes. Um, and when I say denial, Mary, I think you'll agree with me on this. Um, when somebody's experienced a sudden loss, it isn't denial that you don't understand that the event has occurred. Right. 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 You are fully aware that your whole world has been turned upside down, mm-hmm. but there may be a level of psychological denial mm-hmm. that is keeping the facts of that loss at bay, you know, it's maybe, I know that he's dead, but Mm -hmm. I still expect him to walk through the door tomorrow night. Right. Yes, exactly. And I I think it's like the, also the, the biological grace almost that our bodies give us after a, a loss, a trauma, that allows us to carry on and get through those next yes. days when we have to plan the funeral and get our kids to school and feed ourselves. It's like we go into a little bit of shock and denial. Mm-hmm. We know the person has died, but you know we expect them when the phone rings, it's going to be them. So I think it's- um, I love the phrase that you just used, biological grace. Yeah. I always say it's our brain's way of protecting us because yes. there's only so much that it can handle. Right. Yeah. But I like your term better. Biological grace is beauty. I, it's beautiful. I just thought of that. It was good girl. Write that down. Try right. that. You know, speaking of biology. So I think the thing that is most unexpected in the clients that I work with that have experienced a traumatic loss is the impact on the body. Mm-hmm. Right. So we almost expect the emotional impact. We expect the sadness, the confusion, the loss, the anger, the despair, the hopelessness. Um, I don't know if we expect the brain fog. I don't know if we expect that hypervigilance, that waiting for the next shoe to drop. Now I'm fearful that my my other child is going to die in a car accident on his way home from work, you know, just being mm-hmm. hyper aware. But we don't actually realize that trauma and grief takes home in our joints and -hmm. in our organs. So a lot of times what will happen is that the stress hormone is overproduced Mm -hmm. when we're experiencing trauma and grief, especially long-term trauma and grief. And so, and sudden loss often produces long-term trauma and grief. And so Mm -hmm. when that stress hormone is being overproduced, what occurs is it changes our, our biochemistry. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden we have aches and pains. We have a shoulder pain that we just can't diagnose that we can't seem to get rid of. We have the inability. I see this a lot. We have the inability to feel like we can actually take a deep breath that, Mm -hmm. I mean, take yourself back to a recent loss and it's just feeling like there's an elephant on your chest at all times, no matter what you can do, you can't relax. You can't drop your shoulders. You really can't breathe. That is a natural physical reaction to trauma. And your brain is really your brain. Your lungs are really biologically constricted, Mm -hmm. right? So I have clients that have come in that have had hip pain, back pain, um, chronic, you know, 
kidney discomfort. They've gone to the doctor 10, 20 times. That's an exaggeration, two or three times. Mm -hmm. And nobody can seem to diagnose the ailment. And what is occurring is that their body is responding to trauma. Right. It's a symphony yeah. from head to toe. The body is a symphony. That's a wonderful explanation. Um, I, I have you know, patients who come to me and who are bereaved for all kinds of reasons, whether yeah. it's you know, the husband who died of cancer and they were caregiving for months or a child just died due to suicide. Yeah. And everybody expects to the grief, the emotions, they expect the sadness and everything you named, but they're very confused by, they're exhausted. Yes. And they can't focus. They can't co um, concentrate. Um, they can't sleep. So yeah. grief and trauma impacts us, not just emotionally, but physically, spiritually, cognitively. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned driving and the woman who left her door open. Mm -hmm. I, I call it driving under the influence of grief. And yes. All people, you need to drive very carefully after a loss because you're you're grieving and we are not focused we're not concentrating we're much more accident prone people trip they fall they have accidents so um grief and trauma they it affects us our total body you know so not just physically not just emotionally but spiritually cognitively you know that's why i have this person i'm currently seeing whose mother just died and she's the most intuitive mourner I, I've ever met. Mm. She knew I can't go back to, I can't be present at work. I'm going to take time off. Yep. yep. I'm going to, you know, she does all these beautiful rituals. She went this morning and had body work. And I was thinking, she said, my shoulders were aching. Good for and her. she went and had this incredible body work. And he, she had to be reminded to breathe and to take deep breaths. So yes. it's, it's a, a whole body experience. I think also, you know, people either they can't eat or they overeat, they can't sleep or they sleep all the time, can't get out of bed. Um, and they're definitely, you know, more prone to substance abuse and yes. unhealthy, unhealthy ways of coping, um, which is where also I think Eric's house comes in. Um, by providing the support that they do, it's a very effective prevention program right. and intervention program to sort of, so make sure that we help people cope in healthy ways so that they So can, I saw a quote you know, today that I think really, really um, leans into that. And it was emotional regulation uh -huh. is the world's best prevention. And, and when we're talking about Eric's house and all of the different services that they offer, and that's actually, you know, you and I being grief specialists and having worked in this field a long time and having been introduced to a lot of different modalities, and we've seen a lot of different things. What makes Eric's house stand out for the both of us is the array of services that they offer. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. They, they take into account that um, there may be time for body work. Yes. That for some spiritual work is really what's going to speak to them that, you know, for some that are just newly bereaved, they may need something very different than the mom, the dad, or the husband that are five years out and have been doing their grief work. So, um, you know, but what they really, really do at the bottom of, of, of the bottom of the barrel, you know, at the end of the day is they help people learn how to feel confident in their emotional regulation. Because when something like this has shaken our world, has I, I, I liken it to a snow globe. Your snow globe has been turned upside down. Mm -hmm. What happens when you turn it back up? Everything falls, comes back down, but it, it lands in a different spot. So your world isn't even recognizable. You need to learn how to regulate differently because you're a different person than you were before this trauma. And I think Eric's house is so good at recognizing that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious if you don't mind saying um, a little bit more about what does that like emotional regulation, how does someone do that? I, I had a patient the other day who said, I'm not emotionally regulated, but so what, what does a person, not, a, not everybody knows those words. Yeah. 
So yeah. how do people learn how to do that for themselves? Well, first and foremost, which we won't go into, but I think anybody who's watching this will agree, you know, it, even people that have not been traumatized still struggle with their emotional regulation, right? That's for I sure. Mean, it's, we, yeah. we see it left and right, but it's really learning how to zone in, manage and fine tune those emotions that you feel are controlling you that they're running haywire up here, right? And you don't know, you feel so out of control. Mm -hmm. So emotional regula regulation, I would say first and foremost, um, group work. Yeah. Being mm -hmm. able to sit in a circle with other people mm -hmm. and listen to their story, which is not easy, and listen to their pain, which is not easy, realizing that you're not alone, um, learning that you can't talk out of turn, that you can't tell them what to do, that, you know, they are also feel just as out of control as you are. That helps to calm that nervous system mm -hmm. and find some emotional regulation. And then, you know, there are all sorts of things. It's breath work and body work and moving your body and mindfulness. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Getting out in nature. Yeah. You know, my favorite is nature is more powerful than any antidepressant that's ever been created. And that mm -hmm. is in so many research papers, you and I both know it, but a lot of other people don't know that. So there are yeah. a lot of things that you can do to emotionally okay. regulate. I would start with okay. group work though. Yeah. And yeah. I think that um, going back to what you're saying about the offerings of Eric's house, um, the fact that they offer groups, they offer one-on-one -on -one, the spiritual coaching, the body work. And, and like for some people, they, they're not ready for a group because right. it's too, they're, they would be overwhelmed by hearing other yeah. people's stories. So they get to, you know, choose the, the one-on-one -on -one and when they're ready, be in a group. Um, and remember, this is at a time in your life where you feel like you were never in control to start with because your entire world has just been turned upside down. Mm -hmm. So when you, for those fortunate individuals that do find Eric's house to be given the option. It's not just, this is our program. This is our protocol. You need to follow it or we're not for you. It's mm -hmm. okay. You can't do group work right now. Well, we're going to try to meet you where you are. And right. that's again, what I think draws both you and I to one of the things that draws us to Eric's house, because it's not all that common. Um, I know that we probably have on this, you know, this call today, I want to say call in, in today's fundraiser, some individuals that maybe haven't experienced this trauma mm -hmm. live and in person, but of course know somebody that has, right. or are interested and have tuned in today because their girlfriend has experienced a loss to suicide or, you know, their best friend has lost a brother to substance use. And so I think it's important to kind of validate them right yeah. like we've we've touched on in the short time that we have today we've touched on what trauma does to the individual um the survivor that is left behind but what about the caregivers right. what about you and i that are looking after the survivor i always feel like they're kind of forgotten does that resonate with you yeah absolutely um and not recognize sort of, you yes. know, we talk about the forgotten mourners, usually that's children, but these are, you know, the forgotten supporters in a sense, um, who they're supporting people who've just had a traumatic loss and listening to that person's pain, but how do they take care of themselves? Because right. It can bring up a, lo a lot for people. So um, I think trauma, you know, to your point, it doesn't just impact the survivor, but it mm -hmm. impacts the parents and the siblings and, and spouses. Um, so, you know, do you ever make any re recommendations for that population? Right. I love that you just said the forgotten mourner. And I, I want yeah. to change that. Right. I want to mm -hmm. validate that some of this trauma or some of this emotional explosion rolls downhill. Yes. And they're yeah. trying to hold their loved one up, but trying to be a rock, be rock solid at the same time, yet they're not right. invincible. So do right. you ever make any suggestions on how they help themselves so that they can support others? 
Yeah, I mean, so working as um, working as a therapist with a specialty in bereavement and grief and loss, you know, it's really important that myself and my colleagues, you know, because we are experiencing, you know, supporting those who are grieving and traumatized, um, we have to practice really good self care. With what I do, um, is make sure I have my own person to talk to. So I have my own therapist, I have supervision, I have friends who know how to listen. Um, so, you know, I recommend finding someone who can listen to you and yeah. find a way to express all of your feelings. Like people have this idea about feelings that they're good or they're bad, but feelings just are the, mm. the Thing that is going to help all of us where we're there, whether we're in the grieving role or the support role is to, to find a place to talk and express ourselves. And that's whether one-on-one, -on -one, whether with a friend, whether through art, whether through walking in nature. So some of the things I, I, I share with people of how to take care of themselves in addition to get enough rest, eat healthy, move your body. Yeah find some mindfulness practice, um, but is to make sure that you have a place to discharge that kinetic energy that comes along with all these emotions. Um, so even if it's not our loss and we're the one that's giving care, um, that doesn't mean that we're not gonna vicariously experience right. the trauma and the pain. Um, so, you know, our job, you know, so two things, to support someone who's grieving and traumatized requires us to be a witness and a companion. Yeah. Often we think we have to fix it, make it better, take their pain away. And you can't, there is nothing you can say. The hardest thing is to tolerate the feelings that come up in you when you're hearing others pain and to yeah. sit with it because that's the greatest gift that you can give a person. But now what do you do that you've just, felt all that and heard all that you need a place and make sure you prioritize caring for yourself um and there's you know all the things we just mentioned amen you know sometimes i hear in my office that who am i to complain mm -hmm. right a caregiver will come in and i might ask you know the client to step out for a few minutes and i'll just check in with the caregiver how are you mm -hmm. and a the response that i usually get is shock that anybody's even bothering to ask, mm -hmm. right? And B, it's the response of, well, it doesn't really matter how I am because I'm not the, you know, I'm not the one who's lost a child. I'm not the one whose mother just suddenly collapsed in front of me. I'm not the one. I'm like, but oh, you are, mm -hmm. right? Maybe you weren't on the front lines, but you're standing right behind the person who was on the front lines. Yeah. And you're allowing that person to leave some of it in your lap at the end of the day. And you're trying to hold her up while you're trying to be strong um, for her. And so everything you just said was so valid, like just acknowledging that you too have feelings around it. Right. You yeah. don't have to assign a hierarchy to those feelings. Your feelings don't have to be more or less or worse um, than the loved one that you're helping. But by God, yes, you're experiencing something too. And your battery is draining as well. So I love right. all of those suggestions, like check in with yourself. I also want to just mention too, you don't have to be the perfect self-care provider. There's a lot of pressure on people about practicing great self-care. And I just want to say sometimes self-care looks like Ben and Jerry's, you know, like we say, oh, healthy eating, get exercise, rest. I'm like, sometimes yeah. you need to lay on the floor and cry. And sometimes you need to watch TV and eat some Ben and Jerry's. So, you know, I, after um, a loss in my life, someone said, well, you're in this field. It'll be easy for you. Mm -hmm. As if, you know, like you won't grieve as much. Um, but, and luckily, because I am in this field, I knew that what I was experiencing was normal, that I couldn't function, that I needed yeah. to take a leave of absence from work and that I needed at this season to lay on the floor and cry for however long I needed to and not say, oh, Mary, you should be going to yoga and you should be going for walks. Yeah. You know how to do self-care. Sometimes self-care looks like Ben and Jerry's. Oh, 
right? From the mouth of an expert. I just think we gave everyone else permission to take care of themselves as well, no matter what that looks like. And self-care is not always a, ba a bubble bath, ladies and gentlemen. No, it's not always right, a bubble bath. Right, so I, I think that's a great, a great place to end it. Um, yeah. I just loved chatting with you from across the miles. I'm on the West Coast. And you're on the East Coast. Jersey, yeah. Yep. And and I hope that somebody um, that is viewing us today got a lot out of the conversation as well. And maybe that it reset or refined their definition or their understanding of trauma and gave them a little bit of a clearer perception of what Eric's house is about, what we represent what we educate in, how we try to help. Um, I just love spending time with you, Mary. Yes, Thank you for your wisdom. Here, Same here.